Hello. Welcome to the Peace Phoenixism on the Voluntary Virtues Network every Thursday at 1 p.m. And you could also find me on theconsciousresistance.com and theseedsofliberty.com. So today we have Jeffrey Till com coming in from South Carolina. He's a voluntarist, atheist, peaceful parent, parenter, uh, unschooling, homeschooling parent of a 10-year-old, 7-year-old, and a 4-year-old. Uh, he's, he was uh, on the uh, Chuck Morris Speaks show on American Radio Network, which is a nationally syndicated radio show. Uh, he's a writer for Liberty.me. And the way I found him was through the School Sucks uh, podcast. He was interviewed by Brett uh, Vinoit, I think that's how you say it, <laughs> the, uh, on his article, mm -hmm. The Complete Case for Home Education, 54 Arguments, a, uh, a massive uh, argu uh, article about... Uh, you know, all the uh, ridiculous um, arguments that people have or complaints <laughs> people have, you know, about homeschoolers or unschoolers. Uh, awesome read. I highly recommend it. We'll include that in the description. And he also has a blog, uh, 500years.org, 500years uh, spelled out, uh, .org. And, uh, and then the Facebook page is called Jeff Tills FHY. So, Jeff, thanks for coming on the show. Hi, Danilo. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Yeah, definitely. I re I've been, uh, you know, I heard you on the School Sucks. I'm like, oh, man, I got to get this guy. <laughs> I, uh, I, I love, because I have kids too. I have a five-year-old and a three-year-old. And so I do a lot of uh, writing uh, about, you know, homeschooling and unschooling and uh, talking about government schools and, and uh, you know, what they teach, what's the actual lessons <laughs> that they teach. It's, uh, it's not just, uh, you know, that America's number one, although that's <laughs> one of the primary mm -hmm. ones. Yeah. Um, but uh, so, yeah, so this is really, um, um, you know, sentimental topic for me. I'm very passionate about it as well. So, um, so yeah, so, so can you start us off with um, how you became a volunteerist? You know, what got you down this path? You know, books or podcasts or personalities, things like that. Um, sure. Um you know, I, th I think I've 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 always been uh, to some degree. I I never really had any sort of uh, socialist leanings or or conservative leanings, uh, but I've always sort of uh, picked my worldview from sort of a Chinese menu of things uh, that that did turn out to be uh, libertarian in nature. Probably about um, say fifteen or seventeen years ago, I read Atlas Shrugged. and back then, you know, the internet was uh, not what it was today, so I was pretty much alone. Um, so I, I had to just find things uh, that 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 were available. So I, I would get Cato books and subscribe to Reason magazine. Um, then in in two thousand seven, we you know we saw the Ron Paul campaign come through, and I was just um, sort of blown away that there was a libertarian on TV, and that sort of led me to find a bunch of other stuff. Uh, the whole Mises gang uh, then found Peter Schiff, uh, then found Stefan Molyneux and Freedom in Radio. And then later, uh, School Sucks Project. And all of this has sort of further radicalized me from being someone who thought he had a couple ideas and not really a political vocabulary uh, to someone who has a very sort of deep hobby, you know, learning about ethics, economics, uh, schooling, politics, et cetera. Yeah, it's funny that you mentioned radicalized because um, from our perspective, we're not radical. <laughs> it's like we don't consider ourselves radical. We just consider ourselves like, you know, how, how radical is it to... Um, to want to personalize and individualize education to your to each kid rather than send them off to a place where they're treated as a, you know as a conformist you know subject or you know number in a classroom of 30 people with one teacher like you know how can you really expect the child to get any sort of a individual education in an environment like that right so yeah i mean even <laughs> As, as, as I got deeper and deeper into the education topic, um, school became more and more repulsive to me to the point where it, it started off as just being a state of nature that you have to go and everyone goes and all the way to the point where like, w what am I doing uh, sending my kids somewhere for 40 hours a week where they're largely unhappy and they're sort of fed the same piece of information that everyone else has and they're being graded and they're ma made to take tests and they're made to ask for permission to go to the bathroom and... <laughs> All this sort of helpless terror, you know, all of a sudden it seems like a real, really monstrous thing to do uh, when, when you scrutinize what education or schooling uh, is in, in the, the public arena. And so it, it became to the point where, yeah, it doesn't feel radical. It, it feels like it would be, you know, radically cruel to actually make them go. 
Yeah, exactly. And I tell people who are, who are um, <clears throat> you know, trying to uh, dissuade me from doing this is like, so honestly, um, how can you, you know, look back at your, exp- you know, experience in, uh, in public school and how can you, you know, tell yourself st- with a straight face <clears throat> in the mirror and say, um, you know, I want to send my kid to a place that I d- didn't enjoy myself. And isn't that a bit sadistic? <laughs> Yeah, I just I just wrote an article um, on this very topic. I was asked to submit. Uh, there's another uh, volunteerist who's putting a book together on unschooling and asked for submissions. And is that Skyler, I took, Skyler Collins? Yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. Were you asked? Were you asked to do it as well? Uh, yeah. Well, I'm going to interview him as well. But uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I should do that too. <laughs> That's a good idea. <laughs> yeah, I think well, I think he's uh, he's he's looking. He um, he reached out to do uh, submissions. I have I haven't met Skylar. We just we just sort of passed notes in Facebook like uh, you and I did. Yeah. Um, but I wrote the article. I wrote the gist of it is that to be able to unschool your children is that you first have to imagine yourself um, being unschooled. Like, could could I have uh, been successful had I not gone to school myself? And until you do that analysis of you know what I've gotten the right knowledge I wanted to get, what I've been able to pursue other opportunities, what I've been able to manage my time better, what I've been happier, uh, all of those kind of things. If you can imagine them upon yourself, and sort of de-school yourself in that that thinking, then you'll have the required empathy to be able to apply that to your children. But I I don't think uh, if if anyone doesn't believe that they could have uh, been successful with unschooling. You know, if they don't believe that themselves, I don't think they can really believe that for their children. And they'll probably always have uh, this bit of doubt that, you know, even, even after they make the intellectual case, and that that's even a, it takes a long time to make too, mm-hmm. is to make the educational case that, okay, I understand that the school was designed by the Prussians to, um, you know, convince military people. Uh, you know, it's been, it is boring, it is the wrong knowledge, it is obedience, it is apathy, it is conformity. You know, all those things take a long time to understand, but I really don't think it's until you develop empathy for your children that you can really apply uh, unschooling to them. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I had a person I was talking to about this, uh, actually a family member, <laughs> and uh, and they said that when I was younger, um, I went to a, a, a public school where they could beat me, right? And mm-hmm. and I learned to love learning. <laughs> like I, I loved learning as a result of that. I'm like I'm like you need pain. To, yeah. To oh really? So they, that, that's what they confessed to? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a very strange confession because you yeah. know I, I was basically saying you know they're forced to learn this information that they have no choice. Uh, in the matter you know it's not up to them it's up to the you know the curriculum and the and whoever chooses you know what what they have to learn but uh and the bureaucrats i guess but uh but that's the whole thing when you bring up force you know the element of force as as it relates to anything that's that's government um people get you know they get fidgety they don't like to hear that side of it you know that that you have no choice Mm -hmm. that yes there's compulsory education uh, or sorry, compulsory attendance laws. There's there's truancy. What happens if you don't go to school? <laughs> you know, you know, you, you your parents get fined, or you know, they can get arrested or in prison. Like what? Seriously? <laughs> yeah. No. No one. No one sees that. Um, does doesn't see the force behind it. And and the people I've talked to get really angry if I if I mention that because I I think they they do the whole ethical calculation in their head. Maybe not as quickly as as you or I can. But if if we think that forcing people to do something is morally wrong, and if we think taking their money to pay for it is morally wrong, then that makes school uh, unethical or you know immoral, and that's a, kind of a really scary thought for people to have, especially if they have their kids in school, and especially if they were you know had school inflicted upon them themselves. Now, were you? Um, I, I presume you went to public school. Of course, <laughs> of course I did. Yep, and so did your wife. Did, now, did you did you have a hard t- time bringing her along to the unschooling idea? Um, well, I think like yourself, I'm I was I am more, uh, you know, read in this you know volunteerism and um, you know the peaceful parenting and all that kind of stuff. So I'm more you know deep into the philosophy. So yeah, I had to more um, talk to her about these concepts. And actually, but one thing I should say is. I'm very grateful to Stefan Molyneux because when my son, my firstborn, was like close to one, uh, that's when I first heard of Stefan Molyneux and his um, the spanking 
um, you know, perspective. And that's how I got introduced to him. And then everything else came after that <laughs> from... Oh, really? Yeah, so... I, so you started with spanking? Did you now? Did you already have sort of a, a liberty mindset before that, um, or is it mostly just spanking sense, that started? Well, I mean, I grew up with holistic. Um, you know, I'm an acupuncturist, Chinese herbalist, Eastern nutritionist. Mm-hmm. So I, I was, you know, very much into nutrition and, you know, uh, learning about, you know, GMO foods and vaccinations and Monsanto and things like that. So I was against those things already, but um, but I, re- I didn't realize the bigger picture, <laughs> you know, volunteerism, and uh, and so I just started to apply those vo- volunteers principles to parenting, and. Um, and it all came together. And actually, you know what? Taoism, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Taoism, which is the, the f- philosophical backbone of Chinese medicine. Taoists are basically um, <laughs> the first libertarians, or you can say volunteerists. <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I don't know much about <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It's, about it's really like a live and let live philosophy. You know, it's like, you know, you read the book, The Tao Te Ching, you know, it's, it's like 2,500 years old. But a lot of the stuff he says, you know, it's like it's like all about yielding, you know, using your opponent's force um, against him, right, by yielding. So it's not about brute force. It's about the power of the feminine energy, basically, and that the soft overcomes the hard, right? Water over time overcomes even the hardest of stones, right? So so that's kind of what, uh, what influenced me. And so that's why volunteerism basically... It just made a lot of sense. It clicked, <laughs> you know, and then the mm-hmm. peaceful parenting and the, you know, no spanking and all that kind of stuff. It just just made sense to me. So, um, so yeah. So I've I've been <clears throat> reading all this stuff and uh, and and teaching her. And so we're now we're basically on the same page. So, so that's good. Yeah. No, that's that's great. Yeah, we've um, we haven't had too much resistance uh, from my family, and um, uh, or, or my wife's uh, wife's family. They they still get sort of antsy and curious about asking uh but they don't they don't get angry anymore uh Uh, when we first moved down here to south carolina we were meeting new people left and right and it was very we had just taken the kids out of school to start unschooling and you know i came up i've i've learned how to um answer that that question about a hundred different ways so that people don't get offended yeah uh or i i have other ways of uh of you know, sort of provoking people as well to see if 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 I if you know as as they sort of understand, can I push it a little bit further and have them sort of self examinate a, a bit too? And, and I've 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 had some uncomfortable conversations. I've had some productive conversations. Um, but a lot of times, you know, people you say you're an anarchist, and they're like, oh, that's interesting. But then you say, well, I don't we don't think school's right, and then they get angry. <laughs> So it, it's it can be, you really have to tiptoe. The, you know, people are gonna, uh, or, you know, or, or you're gonna get yelled at, or they're gonna they're gonna be insulted. Um, to be gentle, we I say things like, "Well, it works out for my family. Uh, we have a lot of time at home, and we prefer to do you know to sleep in. You know, and people don't get too upset. But if I say, I, you know, I, I think uh, schooling is the largest waste of time ever invented in all of humanity in all history <laughs> and that it's fundamentally immoral then you know someone's going to spit on me or punch me in the face <laughs> right yeah some people um you know they, they they give me the argument well you went to public school and you turned out okay <laughs> it's just an interesting argument and and uh, i get approached that one of two ways the first way being well if i was uh, physically abused as a child and then I grew up to be a successful businessman. Would you say, "Well, look, you were physically abused, yeah. and you turned out <laughs> so that ju- does that justify the the prior um, violation of consent? You know, <laughs> violation of human rights? No, of course not." And then the other thing is the um, the Bastiat's uh, seen and the unseen, right? So that's the problem with statism is that they look at the bridges, they look at the the military, they look at NASA, they look at all these things that government has uh, you know supposedly created. But they don't look at what was destroyed, the, the potential that was annihilated as a result of the force that was required to mm-hmm. construct yeah, those absolutely. things, right? So the unseen escapes everybody. And the same thing with public school. You know, 12 years was robbed of most of everyone who went to public school because they weren't able to pursue the things that they wanted to pursue, you know, voluntarily, things that they were passionate about that was, that was eliminated, that was sidetracked. And... Um, and that's what you don't see. That's what you don't see what people could have become, <laughs> right? Yeah. No, I, I also just, I have another, um, on my blog, there's an article uh, called, I think it's called Six Sigma, um, which is about the when school fails uh, to do what it was supposed to do, meaning 
when it fails to make you obedient and and conformist and I, I have a little bit of theory that that a lot of probably free thinkers are failed school projects mm-hmm. um, but what I realized as I thought about this is that there was a lot of damage you know you say well you, you turned out okay and you went to public school uh, it took me probably a good 10 years 15 years to sort of de-school myself and I, I didn't really know that I had to be de-schooled I was just sort of stumbling through it and uh, saying because I, I immediately after after I finished college I went to Boston and eventually got a job uh as a management consultant, where I worked 70, 80 hours a week wow. uh, at, Pri- at Pricewaterhouse Coopers. Wow. And, you know, everything in my mentality was like, uh, I have to get this job. You know, I have to be successful. I have to uh, go to the next station. And you know, regardless of how much I hate this, um, I'm going to, uh, you know, be a, a management consultant at this prestigious firm. Hmm. And, and I did it, you know, in a way of, of just sort of to fulfill. The continuation of, of how I thought life was supposed to go on, and then to make my parents happy, uh, and then to prove myself that I have this this worth in the world. Yeah. And it took me a, a, so much analysis to sort of unwind from that, and then do other things, um, you know, to to eventually sort of free myself uh, to to get myself out of obligation, out of out of other people's expectations. And I think I did it, but I didn't know I was doing it or, or, or had to know how to do it. Now, take another person. I have a friend, Zach, who is 22, and he just dropped out of a very prestigious university, and he already knows now that he has to de-school himself. But he's 22, and he already can sort of begin that analysis and that process in a very productive way very early. So he hasn't not going to waste not only the 12 years, but then the other you know, 15 years that I had to uh, deprogram. And then I have another friend, Isaac, uh, who was unschooled himself, and he he didn't have to de-school. And he, he pretty much began his adulthood around the age of 14 or 15, <laughs> uh, was already uh, buying and flipping houses, uh, you know, did he? He did. Uh, you know, get his his college degree by the time everyone else finished high school. <laughs> wow. um, you know, and then you know, at at now he's I think he's thirty, and uh, you know has already started his own his own uh, you know venture funded startup uh, three years ago. So it's just you know you say like oh you went to school and you turned out okay, <laughs> and it's it's again like you say about um, you know what, what the opportunities that you don't see. Mm-hmm. Is that there actually? I think there is real damage that is uh, inflicted on people, and they just—they probably just can't see it because mm-hmm. it's their state of nature. Yeah, yeah, and um, so unlike you guys, um, <laughs> my family, I get considerable resistance because you know we're pretty much the only ones that do this uh, in our family, and um, or in the whole state of New York, practically. I, I would, I would <laughs> yeah. bet, right? Although, I mean, no, no one up in Boston would ever, do, you know, homeschools. Oh, really? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, it, that was completely unheard of. I mean, I, uh, I have been able to get in touch with a lot of homeschoolers and unschoolers um, here uh, through Facebook, Facebook groups. And um, and one volunteerist on Facebook I met uh, who actually lives in Long Island, um, where actually we do the uh, the Seeds of Liberty podcast, um, um, uh, me and him and another guy from Alabama. <clears throat> but... Um, but yeah, so it's wonderful to to meet people. You know, you, you know, we are scattered and far apart, but we do get together occasionally, and and that's and it's awesome, you know, and and and, uh, <laughs> and I love it because that's one of the other uh, criticisms that people have is you know, what about socialization? You know, and, which is, to me implies that they think that homeschooling means you lock your kid in a room <laughs> and you throw yeah, books you make, at them. Yeah, you make, you make them quilt, yeah. basically. Yeah, and uh, and that's it. <laughs> you know, you don't meet people, which is uh, completely ridiculous. You know, of course, every single day we go out uh, to the park, to the playground, to museums, to hike, you know, hiking or, um, you know, trails or whatever. Um, and uh, we're always meeting people. And uh, it's beautiful. I, I absolutely love it. And my kids have no problem talking to any like you know how i noticed this in some in some uh, families where the parent would tell their child sit there be quiet don't move and the child just mm-hmm. listens like like sits there like a robot just sits there obedient and does not move and that's kind of scary to me when i see that i'm like when i see a child respond like that to a parent w- what makes me think is 
how is the how is the home? <laughs> you know, yeah. how much beating is there or yelling or punishment is there in the home for the child to be that obedient to their parent, right? And it's just so sad because that's not what a child should be. <laughs> a child shouldn't sit and be quiet like that, you know? It should be running around and playing and having fun, shrieking, you know, with joy. So <laughs> Yeah, no, ab- ab- absolutely. Um, so you, you, your five-year-old would be going to kindergarten this yeah, this year. Had a, um, yeah. So it's going to get real, right? So this is uh, if you've been getting resistance from your family. Uh, once you know he, he's actually supposed to be getting on the school bus or whatever, it, it'll probably be much more apparent that that you're you're not just all talk with the uh, the unschooling yeah. stuff, right? Yeah, my. Um my, 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 my kids, they, uh, you know, they see the school bus passing. They know what the school bus is because we go to the library and most books at the library, especially around, you know, let's say the beginning of the school year, September, it's, it's like, you know, first day of kindergarten, first day of first grade, first day of whatever. <laughs> and so they talk about it. It's, it's in everything. It's amazing how saturated mm-hmm. the, the uh, children's literature is of, um, of government. Not, not just government schooling, but just government. Like, like there's there's some some books and some shows that they watch where I just look at it. And I'm like, man, all they're learning about is pure government stuff. Like, uh, you know this uh, this show called Caillou. They they like to watch this show. Yeah, Ca- yeah. yeah. So I, I was watching one day and I noticed all the government jobs. Like he's learning about different jobs and every single job was a government job. Garbage man, the postal worker, the teacher, <laughs> you know, the policeman. Yeah. Every single one was a government. I'm like, don't they have to learn about non government stuff? Yeah, well, I think. <laughs> I think Caillou is actually produced by the Canadian government. Oh, is it? Oh my god! <laughs> yeah, and if you the um, the preschool channels are almost uh, if you if you look at the source of the programming, yeah, uh, about half of it is sourced from like uh, Australian government and the other half from Canadian government. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Uh, if you just go through the the whole list of shows, now we haven't we haven't been had those shows on for a bit because my kids are a little bit older. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. But I used I used to sort of look them up. Wow. <laughs> um, at, at one point I was I, I bought the URL uh, Prisoner of Kids TV, uh-huh. Uh-huh. Um, which I was going to start a, a a sort of information site to to show to sort of analyze children's television, but I never I never got it off the ground. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. So so another thing I wanted to say is um, they see the school bus in our neighborhood dropping kids off you know um at you know what three o'clock something like that and and so they know what it is you know it takes the kids to school and i and i so i basically have told them do you want to go to school no why school's not fun (laughs) like okay that's good enough for me (laughs) well my my um when we told our we asked our kids uh we had a conversation with them when we were taking them out of public school and again i don't know if i told you the story on on the air or before we, we started recording uh, but I had I had sent my kids to public school just as soon as they became school aged, uh, just like I was, and I hadn't given it much thought. And it wasn't until I, I had this long process of of research and intellectual argument building, and then emotional argument building, that I was able to, and then you know convincing my wife as well, that I was able to take them out. But when I said, um, you know, how would you like not to not go to school anymore? Uh, you know, their eyes just got really wide, and they're like, really. <laughs> And I'm like, well, it's, it's up to you. You you know, you you can if you want to go. And and yeah. both kids said, you know, I'll know. You know, we're not going to go anymore. <laughs> how far, how far advanced were they? Uh, my daughter was halfway through third grade, and my oh. my son was halfway through kindergarten. Uh, so my 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 daughter did go to quite a bit of school um, before I before I I righted my ship. <laughs> so was she the, was she happier than your son? Like, to, oh, wait, the older one is a daughter. You said. Yeah, my older one's a daughter, and my. So was she happier to to leave it than your son? Were they were both happy? Uh no, my my son my son expressed more uh, outward joy. <laughs> oh really? <laughs> for not having to go, he really disliked it. Okay. Um, and then we have tons of kids that come over that are school kids uh, from the neighborhood, and I always I always survey them about whether they want to go to school or not. Oh, I do, and, I do that too. I love doing that. <laughs> <laughs> and the the response is is one hundred percent. No, I hate school. <laughs> Yeah, I do that too. I'm like, like even like later, like nine or ten years old. I'm like, you go to school? Yeah. Do you like it? <laughs> so why do you go? <laughs> because I have to. <laughs> so sad. Yeah, I, I'm, I have an idea on my sort of project to do list that I want to do sort of a, uh, a a puppet show slash cartoon on unschooling that's directly for kids to to put on YouTube. Mm-hmm. Um, that has all of these, uh, you know. I'll sort of repackage the fifty-four arguments, yeah, but yeah. put them in into the favor of the child in some some way that they can consume it. Cool. Which I, I think 
Uh, I don't. I, you can't hold me accountable for when this is going to be done. But I, <laughs> and and I could imagine receiving death threats as well. Oh, for I know. doing it, you know. But if we could, you know, if we can't convince parents, maybe there's some way we can begin uh, convincing the kids. Yeah, yeah. And I think I think uh, Brett Vinat is sort of trying to do that to some degree with high school kids. He he tries to. Uh, uh, although I I find his podcast to be appealing to me and I'm for, I'm 44 years old mm-hmm. you know but to actually try try to start convincing the kids that they shouldn't be in school might be an interesting angle to to pursue yeah I had I have a friend who um, wants to take her her kid out um, but the thing is if if they stay there for long enough they will become like I guess um, they will you know not desire to be free of it you know because they form their connection they form their friends you know their cliques and everything and and then they kind of don't want to leave because all their all their you know the people they know all the friends they had you know they gain are in school and so i've seen some people when they wait long enough like let's say ninth or tenth grade they don't want to leave because of all the you know all of that and so yeah if you can do it the earliest possible um, yeah, well, they. If you're in high school, you also sort of see graduation pending, and you have this. You've been told that, you know, if you don't get that that degree, yeah, that you're you're, you're gonna you're gonna be worthless. You're gonna yeah. be uh, poor and destitute, and mm-hmm. without an identity for for the end to the end of days. You know, you won't get into college, then you won't get a good job. Um, so there's you know a lot of pressure to do that. Now, what would I wish? Um, if you know everybody, if they just left the school building uh, open with some some teachers there. Then there's a good chance that when my kids got older, I'd say like, you know, go over there and take a math class, you know, and uh, go play the dodgeball or whatever mm-hmm. when you feel like it. Mm-hmm. But there's no there's no sort of either or. It's not like you can just show up and uh, make a pot and um, sing a song <laughs> and then you know like one day a week and then go home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. pick and choose right? a la carte. <laughs> yeah, I mean, which I mean that that would be then they could go hang out, you know, if they when they're, when they're older and they want to meet their boyfriend or girlfriend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know the the, the the socialization issue is, you know, is is BS for the most part. You're, you know, kids do get out, but the sad part is, ninety um, percent of kids are all locked up during the day for mm-hmm. most of the day, and then they have to come home and they got to do homework and uh, uh, get get their shower and their meal or whatever, and then get in bed early enough. The kids kids in our neighborhood have to get up around five thirty in the morning to if you know they want to have breakfast and stuff before the the bus comes at six fifteen. Uh, a lot of them don't get home until, you know, the earliest is three fifteen. But a lot of kids are then put into latchkey type programs and don't get picked up by their parents till five thirty, and then have to be in bed by seven thirty if they're gonna make that that five thirty wake up time. So there's, they, they only have the fa- these families are all sort of cooking with like about an hour and a half <laughs> yeah. of family time per day, yeah. and that's probably a lot of that's like you know in the morning it's like get up. You know, eat your breakfast, hurry up, hurry up, but go, you know, get on the bus. And then mm-hmm. at, at home, it's like, you know, do your homework. You've only got, you know, 45 minutes before, <laughs> you know, you have to go to bed. <laughs> um, and unfortunately for our kids, that means there's not a lot of time where the other neighborhood kids are around. So the, the weekends, they're big, they're big fun fest with the other kids. And we, we meet, we meet other uh, unschooling families. Um, my kids have, uh, uh, horseback lessons and taekwondo that, and other homeschooling stuff like that. But I, I sort of wish even more, like just ten percent more of the kids were sort of freed mm-hmm. uh, from the school system. Um, it, you know, just it would just, just even be nice to have kids around the neighborhood more often. Yeah, and I, I, I don't really understand parents who who decide to have children and then decide to only you know to delegate the entirety, almost the entirety of their raising to the state. It just uh, seems really weird, and it seems like it creates more tension than it's worth. Yeah, you know, it's funny. Um, people when people criticize me uh, for the homeschooling and uh, unschooling uh, model, uh, one of the things I say also is, who do you think does more research and educates themselves more? The people who send their kids to public school, or the people that <laughs> choose to homeschool? Like, like, do people just wake up and say, you know what? Forget school. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna keep them home. Why? I don't know why. <laughs> you know, <laughs> nobody. Yeah. It's like we are the, you know, homeschooling in general, or you know, unschoolers or volunteers are pretty well read. You know, and 
and um, competent in expressing these ideas. And we have done this. Like, this is not a decision that we do to make more friends. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or, or, enter, or enter in very lightly. Because you have to, yeah. especially if you were schooled yourself, you have to sort of violate every every bit of indoctrination and programming that you've already had inflicted upon you. And, and, that's, and then you have to defy every one of your neighbors and every, one of, every person in your family and the whole 90%, 7% of the rest of the world who somehow have the strong conviction that, that school is good, but at the same time didn't even spend five minutes thinking about it. Yeah. And, and I know this to be true because I didn't spend five minutes about thinking about it before I put my kids on the school bus. You know, I think my wife looked up, you know, and we wouldn't even think about who their teachers would be or even what school they'd go to. We just picked the one that, you know, that was open up in our, t- in our town, you know, that was closest to our house. And, you know, you just look at the schedule and it's like, you know, fill out this form and then make sure your kid's at the bus stop on this day and that's it. Uh, to unschool, you know, I probably, you know, I had to uh, listen to, you know, a thousand hours of free domain radio podcasts. I, I read six or seven books. Uh, you know, I, I researched, um, you know, curricula before I was before I was convinced of unschooling. Yeah, I mean, it, it took me, you know, probably, you know, it was a solid year worth of, of research and uh, intellectual case making before I could make this decision. And I, I know no public school parent is doing anywhere near that much research or thought <laughs> yeah. uh, before before making, a, you know, a decision that not only affects 15,000 hours of their child's time, uh, but one that they'll violently defend, you know, if if anyone says it's wrong. So it's 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 bizarre. It's really bizarre. I agree. Yeah, and then when you when you tell them all that, all the things you read and all the podcasts you listen to, then they come back with like a very um, simpleton type argument. What about socialization? Did you even consider socialization? <laughs> like, yeah. what the hell are you talking about? You think I never considered that? Right. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's almost insulting, but but then we can't we can't like you know be angry. You gotta you gotta you know talk calmly and just um, because another thing that I I get is. Um, when you tell people, especially family, <laughs> when you tell people that you're going to not send your kids to public school, you're going to homeschool, they get offended because they take it personally. It's a personal affront to how they raised you, right? Or how, mm-hmm. how you know, they raised your cousins or whatever, your family members or your parents. Um, and that's sad. It's like, it's like everybody has to be like you, <laughs> you know, it, like we have to be carbon copies of our parents. You know, how can how can we progress as a, as a species if we are carbon copies of our yeah. parents? You know, no, that's 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 a great point. <laughs> well, I, you know, I, I'd like to think I don't know if this is true, but that people quickly do the both the intellectual and, and the sort of moral analysis um, when you say they don't have to go to school and they they look at what could be a potential mistake that they made. And, and that's sort of what, that's sort of what I, I, I sort of think that's going on a lot of times is that they're even less concerned about your children or, or my, my you know, in-laws would be less worried about my children than just the magnifying being put on their decision making. And the same thing applies to spanking too. <laughs> sure, they, right? yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, if you, um, now, both my wife and I are, are lucky that our, our parents never hit us. Oh, okay, great. And so I didn't even have to do, when it came to our children, we never even had a conversation about whether we were going to spank or not spank. We just um, presumed that we weren't going to and and haven't. So that that wasn't, because I, I, have, I have a very good friend who it was kind of a, a fairly large uh, emotional awakening when he realized that he shouldn't be spanking his child. Um, you know, and and he he reversed it quickly before his child was very old. But it it it's a really sort of long lasting bruise in his mm-hmm. brain. Mm-hmm. Um, and most people don't don't even go through that that transformation process if they if they think spanking is just they they just keep on doing it. So it's a, a blessing of sort that he managed to go through the transformation and come out the other end better for it. Um, and I'm I'm just delighted that it, that my wife and I never had to had to think about it. And that's uh, if I can just expand on that. Yeah. Um, w- hopefully, when my kids are having their children, they're not going to have to go through this emotional and intellectual discovery process to mm-hmm. make sure their kids don't go to school. Mm-hmm. Um, this um, again to talk about another friend who was unschooled, 
there was no consideration for putting their kids into school for even a second. Uh, it was just as automatic uh, as it would be for a public school person to send their kids to public schools. Uh, no research required. So it'd almost be better if, if, if our, I don't know if this is right, but it may be better if, if, if our children don't need to have a, an intellectual discovery process to decide not to send their kids to school. Well, it's just it's just called a moral advancement of the species. <laughs> you know, that's yeah, like, no, that that's a great that's a great title for it. Yeah, you know, because it's like so much of what we do is uh, you know the appeal to popularity or the appeal to antiquity, right? <laughs> the mm-hmm. Appeal to popularity being, I have to I'm doing this because everybody's doing it, right? No thought required. Or appeal to antiquity, I'm doing this because it has been done this way for decades or centuries, and so who am I to question it, right? Yeah, but, those those even supersede the you know the argument from authority, because yeah. uh, even if you probably didn't have the compulsory uh, attendance laws, um, the, the public school would still probably produce people who automatically put them in, mm. and were just as terrified of the kids you know missing a day, not missing a day, or not missing an assignment. Yeah, yeah. So, so when we, um, you know, you know, a lot of people like, you know, they value culture. Like, culture is a wonderful thing, right? Various, various, you know, places of the world have their own cultures and customs and things, and that could be good, right? But the problem is that culture stifles um, creativity and ingenuity and you know, critical thinking. Like, you know, people do things not because they thought about it, but because everyone around them doing it has been doing it that way for thousands of years, right, or hundreds of years, and that's not really. <laughs> I don't think that's conducive for again the moral or intellectual advancement of the species, right? Um, like, mm-hmm. like you know, Galileo and Kepler, they didn't do what they did because they're going to make more friends, but because that's what they saw as the truth, regardless of if they were, you know, persecuted by the church or executed <laughs> as a result of it, right? And uh, and that's called advancement, <laughs> right? Yeah. So that I mean that that that'd be interesting if um, so right now if if public school parents don't think about it for a second and unschooling parents have to wrestle with their minds for you know and re- listen to a thousand podcasts and everything to make the decision would unschool children as adults still think about this, but maybe think about education in terms of uh, you know epistemology or in methodology of, of how to learn and not even have to clutter their minds with, you know, do I have this, um, the cinder block building that, that you're supposed to go to or not. And so they could still have this intellectual pursuit of understanding education, but not have it being cluttered with, uh, you know, the violence and the, the tediousness of the, of the public education system. Well, the way I look at it is, is, um, no, I, I don't think, um, you know, successive generations of unschoolers will will just you know follow because their parents did it. Where I think they'll they'll basically do things um, as they as they understand it intellectually, right? Because we because you know the idea of unschooling is to encourage kids to follow their passions, to pursue what they're interested in, and you know it's it's a it's a belief in the individual, right? <laughs> it's not a, it's yeah. not about a collective, right? So so it, they they will con- I I think they will constantly be reevaluating and reevaluating their position because that's what the, that's what you know I think unschooling parents promote in their kids they want you want them to think for themselves and to you know not take things at face value right and question everything right (laughs) Mm -hmm. yeah no absolutely and it you know it's also going to be you know unschooling is also freedom so it's freedom to do what you want yeah not being told what to do and you know i think when if you experience freedom growing up you're going to resist not having freedom when you're older and it's it's not going to be again that uh, the prolongment of antiquity or of culture. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it'll it'll just there'll, there'll be a, re, a repulsion to not being free, and then hopefully a natural curiosity and uh, you know to learn and explore. Let me give you another um, another argument. What one of my family members gave. I don't know if you included this in your article, but um, he said. Um, he said, what do you want your kids to be? Don't you want them to be educated, have a good job, um, you know, have a good house, <laughs> have mm-hmm. a good car? Don't you want that? And my answer was, no, I want them to be happy <laughs> first and foremost. <laughs> those other things don't matter because if, they're, if they have those things and they're not happy, then none of it matters. Like, what, you know, that's the other thing about public education is delayed gratification, right? 
You, yeah, absolutely. For 12 years, you can't do what you want to do because you have to wait to graduation. And then you can't do what you want to do because you got to go to college. And you, you can't wait because you got to get a good job. And, you know. Yeah, and some, somewhere there when you're like 67 years old, there's a, a, like a, a fishing boat and a fishing pole <laughs> yeah, there right. for you. When, when you could have, when you were five years old, you probably could have already, you know, <laughs> spent the day fishing to start with. Right, right, right. So, so um, it's kind of amazing how that's so revolutionary. It's like, what? People, the goal is not to be happy, you know, or the goal is to be happy. You know, that's, is that how can that be revolutionary? You know, like I was interviewing, uh, I interviewed Dana Martin, uh, Radical Unschool. Have you heard, you heard oh, of her? Cool. Yeah, she's awesome. Yeah, lady. I've I've watched a couple of her videos. Oh, she's awesome. Checked her website. Oh, she's an awesome lady, and and I, and she's like, kindness is revolutionary. <laughs> Isn't that a, an amazing statement? How can kindness be revolutionary? You know, but the problem is people don't don't they don't um, apply that they apply that to their family and to their close friends let's say but they don't apply that to everyone they don't apply that to their neighbor or somebody in another country like like who cares about them you know it's like it's what's good for society right that's why we need taxes right so kindness yeah. and compassion is not universal and if it was we'd all be volunteers <laughs> right yeah it's 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 well going back to how we opened the conversation is you know are, are we really the radicals you know yeah. To, to to think that that kindness and and peace and and uh, these these sort of wonderful th themes you know shouldn't be prevalent. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I mean, I was reading your article and and it really um, made a very very comprehensive case. You know, some of the things that um, that I haven't like like one of the things that I never really considered before I read your article was about the homework thing and about that how that robs. Um, free time at home. It's like it's like it's not enough that they rob your free time when you're in school. But now they mm -hmm. send you home with things to do where you can't even do stuff that you want to do because you got to do your homework, right? And yeah, and then they they enlist the, the parents in that as well. And we, when my my girl was in school, that, that was a great point of frustration for our family because my wife would tire of helping her, and she'd say, "Jeff, why don't you go help?" Uh, Addie with her homework, and I'd be like, "Well, I really, I don't want to do homework myself." Um, and I, I didn't, I didn't ever really did, did homework when I was a kid, so I would just be like, "Well, let's just have her not do it. She doesn't want to do it right now." Um, but you knew if you sent the kid back to school the next day with without the homework done, that there would be some uh, some hell to pay with from the teacher. And this is an, in, in another article in my blog. I finally um, thought about this for a few minutes, and you're, if, let's say. Uh, you know, you're probably given about 10,000 assignments, school assignments between homework and classwork at school over the course of the time you're there. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if there was at least two a day for the 160 days, you know, times 12. And every one of, single one of them is expected to be done, regardless of how irre irrelevant or relevant or joyful or joyless it is. There's not one thing in that 10,000 uh, page raft of of assignments where you say like well you know these these ones don't really apply to me so I'm not going to do them <laughs> yeah right you know if you ask if you ask a, a parent at public school like how many per, what percent of the assignments do you expect your kids to do um, you know there's only one answer it's you know it's all of them mm -hmm. and that gets more and more ridiculous you know the more I think about it that that anyone could possibly put forth you know ten thousand or one thousand mm -hmm. uh, different assignments that would be absolutely relevant to every single student yeah. in the entire you know, United States. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and uh, another interesting thing is, um, you know, like my, my family member was saying how there are certain things that people need to learn in order to be a functioning <laughs> member of society, right? I'm like, yeah. all right, so even if, even if you thought that that was a true thing, how would you know or how would anybody know, bureaucrat or, you know, a teacher or superintendent, how would anybody know out of, out of the, you know, millions or billions of bits of information out there articles and books that have been written what is pertinent for you to know and in order for you to know that you would have to be a fortune teller right because the world is constantly changing tech new technology coming out all the time and we're we think that in order to get kids to be functioning we have to get them in a place where they're going to be at least for 12 years maybe 13 i guess and and so they start now they'll be out in what 20 uh 28 and 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 we can predict <laughs> what life will be like and that that information is relevant to that time period yeah well i mean you know the jobs the job they're going to have in 2028 probably hasn't been invented yet <laughs> yeah exactly 
<laughs> so I, I did try to say, like, if, if I could pick the minimal amount of knowledge that I thought was universally applicable to everybody, where you'd, you might have uh, the case to use, a, a weak case to use either compulsion or whatever to, to teach people, it probably would be how to read and write um, and then how to do enough math to buy carpeting. <laughs> and that would probably be enough to to be the minimal you'd say that's 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 how much required schooling is universally applicable to every single person um and that's it but that's only like that's probably only 100 or 200 hours of instruction tops yeah so you'd you'd cut out the other 12 12 and a, three quarters of a year of school at that point yeah and the other great argument um is you know i i ask people how did you learn how to speak Mm -hmm. Were you forced to learn how to speak, um, in, you know, in a classroom with a teacher and books? No, of course not. You know, we all learn how to speak by being around people who speak, right? We just we just acquire the the knowledge and the ability by just seeing other people do it. You know, that's how babies learn. So why can't you apply that same um, that same thought process to you know reading and writing? You know, if you're around people that read and write, perhaps you know what you're gonna start learning to read and write. You know, if yeah, you, if you want to function in society, you're gonna have to learn how to read. So it's a necessity. So you know, it doesn't have to be forced under the people. That's the other thing. It doesn't have to be forced. And then if you really take a, a serious look at that, what they teach in school, um, pretty much everything that most people do for a job has nothing to do with. Uh, Elizabethan poetry or quadratic <laughs> equations or yeah. playing dodgeball. Right. Um, so all, all sort of occupational knowledge is gained outside of school. And then if you look at the knowledge that people enjoy, um, like all the, all the sort of fun subjects that we like, like economics and ethics and history, um, you know, not non-political history, rather, uh, philosophy are all things that they don't, they never, they never really tackle with, within public school. And all the things that are useful, so that all the enjoyable knowledge, or even if you just sort of like football stats uh, or you know learning Star Trek languages, you know, none of that is taught at school. All the enjoyable information, and then all the useful information, like how to how to cook a meal, how to uh, apply for a mortgage, how to buy a car, um, how to drive a car. All those kind of things aren't taught in school either, probably because they're too important to learn. Mm -hmm. So. It sort of seems that the knowledge that they this this one one size fits all sort of factory schooling n neither provides information that's useful, occupational, uh, or or enjoyable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and then some people counter like, "Well, you're so arrogant. You know, you think you you know everything, and you can teach your kids everything there is to know." <clears throat> These people at the school, they're they're licensed. They've gone through. You know, many years of education. They're competent in teaching this stuff. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm like, well. I don't think I can teach them everything. Of course not. You know, there's a lot of things I'm learning myself, and it's a process, and we're learning together. And the other thing is, I don't have to be a chef to know how to cook a dinner, right? I don't have to be a NASCAR driver to know how to drive a car, <laughs> right? Yeah, no, you know? absolutely. <laughs> you don't have to be the best of the best to do what a teacher does. So, <laughs> well, and a, a teacher is kind of a suspect position, anyways, because they they literally went to you know their 13 years of public school. Yeah. Uh, then sort of to probably a, a fairly mediocre college um, and and then right back into the school system you know so so what have the, what, what could have they have learned you know that wasn't just from uh, the boring processes of, of, of lecturing mm -hmm. so you know they have they haven't necessarily really seen uh, the the world outside of school ever mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, right you right have to go right back to school right <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's they, they never uh, go into the market. They never, you know, do a trade for a while, or even I, even you know even even a uh, you know an, an art teacher probably wasn't going to spend too much time actually trying to be an artist, you know, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. actually, that's what I I posted recently one of my articles on um, um, on Facebook, which is uh, government government schools are prisons for the young. And one woman commented, she's like, um, I'm a, I'm a school teacher. And I find it irritating that so many people, you know, talk bad about, you know, public school and about teachers. And, you know, I'm a really good person. I'm, I, I really want to teach the kids and um, I have good intentions, right? So I would appreciate it if you stopped talking bad about us. <laughs> and, <clears throat> and I respond to those people by saying, 
I don't think teachers are evil or wicked or trying to, you know, brainwash or, you know, um, indoctrinate the kids. You know, I think most people go into those teaching positions with genuinely good intentions, right? The problem is the, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, right? <laughs> so good mm-hmm. intentions. Obama has good intentions when he passes, you know, minimum wage laws, when he passes Obamacare. You know, he has good intentions, maybe. <laughs> maybe, I don't know, it's hard to say, but it seems like he has good intentions, right? So good intentions are not enough, and frequently good intentions lead to the complete opposite result, right? So... <laughs> yeah, well, uh, Brett uh, Vinat said this once on his show that um, anytime they make a movie about a spectacular teacher, <laughs> yeah. it's because it's because the teacher did everything opposite uh, to what they were supposed to do in the public school system. You know, it's always someone who then has you know it's uh, you know takes the kids out of school or he uses his own money to, um, to to buy something different or he he brings in his own books. It, he always has to violate the the public school system to to do, to be an exceptional teacher. Mm-hmm. And so if you think of all these well-intentioned teachers are, um, you know, forced into a system of incentives and, and curricula and everything, that probably ruins the, their ability to, to make good on that, um, that desire to just do up the best for the children. You know, and so ultimately they're, they're forced to teach to the test because that's what drives their state funding. And if, if they make it long enough in the institution, they, they, they probably will be ruined anyways. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and then um and then the other thing I tell people is um you know, if you really think that 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 public school gives people, you know, useful knowledge, just look at the the um the jobs that a a graduate, a high school graduate gets. <laughs> you know, let's say he doesn't go to college. What kind of jobs do they get, okay? <laughs> they, yeah. I would assume if you spend 12 years of your life learning a profession or a a discipline um you would be sufficiently masterful at that profession, right? <laughs> 12 years is a long time. I would assume you would be masterful at multiple disciplines after 12 years, right? But the only thing that that college or that high school graduates can can get is a minimum wage job, you know, flipping burgers, going to, you know, working at Starbucks or Barnes & Noble or Dunkin' Donuts. Like, what kind of a, a reflection? <laughs> yeah, what kind of... 12, yeah, 12 years of education... <laughs> To get to get a wage that <laughs> that the the people who are paying it are actually forced you know forced to pay they you can't know, well I they mean, can't pay below because it's illegal right <laughs> yeah so I mean really the the kids might be worth just you know the handful of change or something <laughs> by that time well you know they've been taught to be uh, to be dependent and not to make even if they're not taught hard skills uh, or worth you know worthwhile knowledge they're also taught to be completely dependent you know raise your hand if you have to go to the bathroom. Um, you know, you, you can't even make the smallest decision decision or be unsupervised for a moment mm-hmm. uh, for that entire time. And then right when they're done, you know, there's one day where they're in school and they, they can't make a single decision. And then the next day it's like, go go work and be valuable. Mm-hmm. And it, it's almost, imp- you know, it'd be almost impossible to to find someone that you could actually delegate authority and responsibilities to after telling them that they were incapable of, of doing that for so long. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. And I mean, I'm, that, that almost kind of saddens me to to say that. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Those are the um, the unwritten uh, lessons that every kid learns and is drilled in. You know that you are not an individual, right? You are part of the classroom collective or even the school collective, right? You you just sit in your desk, you be quiet, you listen, you memorize the information so you can spit it back on a test, and then you will be praised. <laughs> mm-hmm. and yeah. if, if you're sufficiently good, you will go to the next level up where you're given more information to memorize and regurgitate on a test. <laughs> because Yeah, but very rarely would, would, would you actually have to do something. You know, learn, learn by participating or, you know, get to pick out what you want to learn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so before we uh, before we sign off, can you just? Um, I, I know you mentioned the um, you mentioned the taekwondo and and uh, and the horseback riding, but just go into a little bit of uh, you know how you what's your method for uh, for unschooling and homeschooling, and how do you apply it for yourself? Uh, we 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 don't have a method. Um, we we don't really do anything that's educational. Now, before we before we started, there was a great le- level of comfort. And us researching curriculum and and seeing homeschooling books and textbooks that you could bring home and online uh, learning programs like Time for Learning or Khan Academy, and um, 
we bought a lot of that stuff and stacked it on a table and then have never used it. <laughs> um, we did uh, when we started. We did. We both. We, we bought both of the older children um, their own their own laptop computers, which which they use extensively. And so there's no there's no education, um, and since they're young, it's it's mostly a lot of playing. Um, you know, my daughter my daughter really likes to go to the store and and to cook, and so that's what she spends a lot of her time doing. Um, my son wants to be a computer programmer. <laughs> um, and uh, and he spends a lot of time on his computer, a lot of time, you know, playing playing video games. Of course, um, when they do want to learn something or find out about something, uh, we just tell them to go look it up for the most part. So you know, how, how many moons are in the uh, in the solar system? Well, you know, go Google that. Yeah, I do that too. It's great. <laughs> uh, you know, or, or we'll find a documentary on on Netflix yeah. and and watch it. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we try to do some some real stuff. Uh, we have a huge art cabinet. Um, we have uh, uh, you know, vegetable uh, vegetable garden in the back uh, in pots that 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 they're, they take care of. Um, so just just stuff like that. There's no they're just they're just free. They're not we're not doing any kind of schooling or anything. That's great. Uh, they, they they do take you know again we had horseback riding classes. They had a Harry Potter camp last week where they it was mostly sort of a science camp. Cool. Um, the Taekwondo is just for, for, uh, homeschool kids. That's during the week and they've, they just got their blue belts there. They're halfway to black belt. Wow. So they'll be able to, <laughs> I don't know, beat people up. <laughs> you know, it's kind of funny. You know what? Uh, I just, something just came to mind when you mentioned what your son, you said wants to be a computer programmer and your, and your, and your daughter just wants to cook, right? Yep. Um, what came to mind was most kids in, in public schools, when you ask them, what do you want to be when you grow up? Most of them give professions that are government jobs. <laughs> I just realized this now, like a policeman or yeah, astronaut. Uh, astronaut or um, uh, what, a lawyer. Te- te- teacher. <laughs> a teacher. I mean, that's just amazing to me. Like, wow. And, uh, and yeah, actually, that's a, great, that's a great approach. You know, when, when kids ask questions, that's when they're primed for learning. That's when they're receptive and they're willing to, you know, um, they're inviting new information. That's great. You know, that's you know, that's so important to ca- capitalize on that. And yeah, yeah now, I, do, you, do you have a plan for your children at this point? Um, so, so I, my approach is more you know free and unstructured, right? Um, unschooling approach. My wife, she came from. My wife is half Romanian, half Hungarian, so she grew up in communist Romania, right, <laughs> mm-hmm. for twelve years of her life before she left. And so I I think that that had a major influence on her and how it, and schooling should be. And so it's been more difficult for her to uh, reject, you know, public schooling, although she has rejected it, but it's been difficult. And so I think she still she still retains that bias <clears throat> towards a little bit of structure. So she's looking for. Yeah. Like, like you mentioned Khan Academy. She likes that. She's looking for a homeschooling curriculum, which is kind of like. Um, an oxy, you know, oxymoron, right? <laughs> or unschooling yeah. curriculum. It doesn't really make sense. Uh, um, it, it, it was, it, I just have to tell you, well, at least from our experience, it was really comforting to my wife to see the, the Calvert uh, curriculum. I don't know if you, you know what that is, no, but it's, no. it, it's, it's both uh, a set of books and, and a computer uh, portal, and it, it essentially replicates the entirety of public school at home, okay. uh, short of the apple on the teacher's desk <laughs> okay and it's it was so comprehensive that it was just very comforting to think that if we were doing the wrong thing that we could implement something like this and they yeah. would have everything mm-hmm. um but that was just one step in in making sort of the uh, becoming more comfortable with the idea mm-hmm. and so finally when we researched all of it we just it felt really good to know what was out there and that we had we had actually done our due diligence, mm-hmm. and then when we actually started unschooling, uh, you know, again, we 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 resisted all the urges to do uh, curriculum or forced activities. The the one activity we do do is we do read with our son, mm-hmm. um, who's it doesn't uh, read yet, and there's no set schedule for unschoolers to read. Uh, some kids don't learn, you know, until they're nine or ten. Uh, others learn earlier, but if you don't force them to read, they're never going to learn how to read. <laughs> yeah, but so so we're not we're not forcing them, but we're, we are encouraging probably probably a little bit more than an unschooler uh-huh. uh, proper would, uh-huh. and mostly because he spends so much time on the computer, yeah, and so much time you know talking about how he wants to take a programming course, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, you know, 
you're, you're really going to help yourself if you if mm-hmm. you figure out this whole reading thing. Mm-hmm. So we've been we've been a little bit more uh, encouraging of that. Um, you know, so that's not completely uh, self directed. We'll say, hey, Huck, come on, let's let's go. Um, Let's go practice reading. Yeah, yeah. So, so there's a um, a Larkin Rose video. Do you follow Larkin Rose at all? Uh, I've heard him. I've heard him speak a couple of times. Okay, but so I haven't read any of his books or anything. Okay, so he's got a great channel, his YouTube channel, and a, a video he did a, a few years ago uh, was um, oh, I forget um, the I think it's like the purpose of education, <laughs> something like that. And mm-hmm. he was basically talking about like what I said, you know, how do kids learn how to speak, right? Well, they can learn how to read the same way. And so basically, what he's saying is that the age that a child learns how to read is not reflective of their aptitude for reading. So basically, if a child learns how to read at nine years old. It's possible, and and there's you know there's a few articles on this of, of of unschooling parents coming out and saying you know my child learned to read at eight nine ten years old and they were like prolific writers like it didn't matter or reading or writing it didn't mm-hmm. matter really what age they learned how to read and write it had no no bearing on their skill level of reading and writing like you know they learned because they were so passionate and they wanted to learn they like and like one kid i think learned from video games like i want to know how to read that so he eventually taught himself another child another girl taught herself to read just by cooking looking at a recipe book because she was passionate about cooking right <laughs> so yeah. so that's one thing that really comforted me when i read that and i heard about other other parents saying that because that's you know that's one thing that's it's it's hard to to free my mind of that like because you know i was you were taught how to read what first grade or second grade something like that and and so you're like well how can you learn how to read without that right so it was really cool to see how so many parents have done it and and you know some child some children i think this one girl would learn how to read at like 9 years old and then she would like she was writing massive amounts of poetry <laughs> yeah well that's, <laughs> you know? that's, everything i've read is that you know even if they don't learn until they're 10 they don't they don't start reading um you know uh dick and jane books they they jump right into you know whatever a 10 year old reads so if that's yeah, like Harry, know, Harry Potter. hunger games or yeah, yeah, right. harry potter or whatever right right so yeah so so yeah, so that really comforted me. And and the other thing I wanted to say is, um, my son, you know, talking about the questions, he asked me, like, I I love those questions, like, um, you know, you know, what is the moon and how far is the moon and why why is the earth heavy and uh, and what else? He says uh, the other day he asked me how many leaves are on are on a tree. <laughs> and that was fun. And then and then you know because I listen to my podcast in the, in the car occasionally when I'm with the kids and 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 I'm always listening to the Tom Woods show and finally he asked me what's daddy what's a Tom Woods show <laughs> so I had to explain he's an Austrian economist and he's like, what's that <laughs> so I was going into and you know what's interesting about my son like I've been into precious metals like that's how I got into uh, volunteerism you know apart from the peaceful parent I was also really interested in precious metals and monetary history like that's what really got me into it and so I learned a lot about it and uh, you know um, I was purchasing silver for a while and so my son he would go with me to the precious metal shop and he would buy and so he's intimately aware of of, of uh, the difference between money and currency I've taught him that like this, yeah this oh, is Nate. just this is just currency this is paper He's like, yeah, it's just paper. And so even when his uh, his cousin was four years old, they would play with this like t- uh, toy um, cash register, and they have like you know quarters, dimes, and nickels. And and the the cousin says, says, Marcus, do you have any more money? He's like, no, I don't have money. I have currency. Oh, okay. Mm. <laughs> So, so explaining what Tom Woods is like. Oh, he, Tom Woods talks about he talks about silver coins and gold coins. And when I said that, oh, his eyes just lit up. <laughs> He's like, <gasps> I'm not, I'm not totally sure, but I, I think uh, Tom Woods does have stuff for for school age children, doesn't he? He has either the, through um, the either Liberty Classroom or through the the Ron Paul curriculum. Yeah, the Ron Paul homeschooling thing. Yeah, yeah. It's um, I did look into. That I haven't, I haven't checked it out, out yet, but I. Yeah, I heard about that. It's like free for the for the like uh, till sixth grade, the sixth grade level. So, um, so that's cool. So, so yeah, we might, we might look into that because because my, if my wife wants to do anything online or pay for anything, I would I would trust first the Ron Paul homeschooling yeah. thing before any other any other thing. Although Khan Academy is really awesome too. So, <clears throat> but uh, but yeah. So um, all right. So then so we'll wrap up. I'm not going to keep you too long. Um, so. Why don't you let people know where they can find your work, uh, you know, your articles, your Facebook page? Uh, sure. So my website is 500years.org. That's spelled out with letters, no numbers. And there I blog, and I'm doing a very slow podcast as well. There's two episodes 
but I'm trying to get out one per month, which uh, isn't very fast, but they're they're very sort of planned out and, and quite elaborate. The second one just went up uh, a couple weeks ago. It's called What Do You Want to Be When You Grow Up? <laughs> uh, I do have a Facebook page. It's Jeff Till's F-Y-H page, I think, something like that. You can look up for it. Uh, if you want to, if, if if you want to, if you want to link that, then you can get updates. Um, and then I'm I'm having uh, again. We talked about uh, uh, the the book that's coming out with um, Skyler. That, that I think that's supposed to be out at the end of the summer, and hopefully hopefully my piece will get accepted for that. And uh, that's it. So uh, I'm just I'm just happy to be part of the the sort of public pu- public intellectual conversation. Uh, you know, happy to do shows like this. So I really appreciate you having me on, Danilo. Yeah, thanks for coming on. I really appreciate you coming and uh, sharing your story. So, yeah, so we're going to put all those links in the description uh, for people to get in touch with you if they want to. So, very cool. Thank you very much, um, uh, Jeff, for coming on the show. So, if anybody wants to donate to this show, um, it's much appreciated. Um, you can you can donate by, uh, through PayPal or through Bitcoin. Um, if you really, really want to send gold and silver, I am not going to complain. So you can do that. <laughs> you want to send me value, you know, we'll find a way to receive it. So, um, <laughs> help out the show if you can, because, uh, freedom is not free most of the time. <laughs> right. Um, although government says it's free, <laughs> mm-hmm. but, um, all right. So thank you very much, Jeff. Awesome conversation. So this is, um, peace, anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network uh, and the seedsofliberty.com and, um, and the consciousresistance.com. Wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye. Great. Thank you. Bye-bye.